Greetings from the dark continent, Conscious Caracal here, Adams Van Sale, here to shine a light not on the goings on down south, but on uh, the art world and uh, some thoughts surrounding art. And here joining me to, uh, not tonight, seeing as it's still uh, uh, afternoon here in South Africa, joining me this afternoon is Gio Panachetti, and he's going to be talking to us about art specifically so just a very short introduction i'm just literally taking from what he describes himself as in his own twitter bio <laughs> and that is a, a social impressionist artist writer podcaster and that's the break the rules podcast mm -hmm. a gonzo philosopher postmodern right and union futurist so uh, we might get into some of those labels somewhere in the podcast uh, but let's see where it goes welcome on the show geo oh thank you Love, lovely to be here um mm. So I, I've uh, followed your work for a while, and uh, in preparation um, for the show, I, I decided to go down a rabbit hole of uh, specifically the art world in South Africa from the 80s onwards. Mm. But but you had a bunch of questions in mind, so I'll do <laughs> like the short version of no, it. No, that sounds so. interesting, man. We can uh, we can get into that as well. But yeah, you're the uh, the trustworthy innkeeper himself. It's in the house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm. And if you notice, uh, my cats are playing or uh, horsing around the background. So if you hear strange noises, the audience. Mm. Um, no, maybe that's like, no maybe problem. will jump on my desk or something. <laughs> yeah. Um, so maybe just a little bit of trivia for those that don't know. The thumbnail that I used for this episode is actually one of Geo's paintings to give you a mm. little bit of an idea. So let's start off with a, a simple question. I think this will lay the bedrock for the, the rest of the conversation. You as someone that creates art in a time where, as I have stated in the description of this episode, in a time where people are almost incentivized to create ugly, meaningless, empty things. Uh, what dr drove you in this direction? How did you go from long time listener to first time caller in regards to creating art? <laughs> well, um, I think it was because when I was younger, um, I, I got like, this is really weird. And usually this never happens. Usually you have to be quite more like farther along. Um, I had like this, when I was in high school, I started getting into the, uh, New York school of abstract expressionism which is kind of like anathema and like you know trad white right-wing reactionary circles but basically i started to look into like jackson pollock and i was inspired by um a painter who like a few painters who were considered almost like mystic level one of them being mm -hmm. nikolai rorish in russia another being mark toby who came like right before the new york school and in the in the seattle like the the sticks of Seattle, they call them the Northwest visionaries. And so, um, and he was a Baha'i person. So he was like, and I was getting into a lot of like new age and perennialism and stuff like that, Julius Sivola and stuff. So, um, and he have, himself was a Dadaist painter. So I started, um, and my mother would, was like a hobby painter, but like, you know, Bob Ross stuff. So then mm -hmm. I started um, just basically doing these little experiments where I was more or less copying different, um, just like purely aesthetic, like uh, styles and methods of various like abstract paintings that I would find. And from there, I sort of went into landscape painting and then like the rest is history. Then I went into printmaking and now like uh, I just consider myself an expressionist because of the wide amount of subject matter that I do from the human figure to the landscape and so forth. So I mean, mm -hmm. And then along the way, like when it came to my writing, when I started to put myself online, I started um, like wait, like before Trump, like around 2014, 2015, I wrote this article in a grad class that I was in and I was in my philosophy masters at the time. And it mentioned this video artist that I was really a huge fan of that became very huge on like on 4chan on Paul. His name was nobody TM. I say him, but it was like a group of people. And uh, I ended up sending the like sending this paper, which it was like uncharacteristic at the time of me. I emailed nobody TM and the editor liked it so much that he put it on the main site, my essay. Hmm. And so from there I figured that I, I didn't want to like write typical because then I started getting into our criticism too. I started reading like Robert Hughes. And then I decided that I didn't want to do like the typical at the time, because the time it was very fresh was like the blogger sphere new reaction. Uh, and I, I wanted to do that. I was involved with like Thermidor magazine and other places, 
but I didn't want to like just write um, the latest like political hot take. <laughs> so our mm. criticism was almost like a natural. And then of course I had developed my own artistic practice after a while. And I met people along the way that helped me because I'm self-taught largely. Um, I didn't go to art school. I contemplated art school, but it was just like, do I really want to be with these people all the time? <laughs> so um, I, from the rest was history. So then I guess I just cemented a niche as like taking contemporary art, like seriously in these spaces. So mm. that's like my backstory more or less, but mm. yeah. No, no, I mean, that's uh that's very interesting seeing as, I mean, this uh, story serves as an example of how people get put on that path. It doesn't mean that you have to go study art or have to go to some art school or have to mm. be some child prodigy. Um, you just need mm -hmm. to start creating. And I think a yeah. lot of people have that hidden talent that they might not even know about. So maybe before, I'm very interested in, about the, the South African aspect that you've been mm. uh, talking about. I actually want to hear what you have to say there. Um, but first, maybe just to... To start off with one of the, the questions, one of the themes that I wanted to discuss is the creation of beautiful things, creation of art. Mm. Um, why is it uh, important? I mean, there's that typical cliche question on the political compass of like the, the business, is the businessman more important than the artist? And then you have to like rate it from, I think, one to five. Now, yeah. that this question is in a similar vein. Why is the artist yeah. important? Why is it important to create beautiful things? Um, the, well, okay. The, this question has been complicated over time because we live in a very, like, um, we live in a very, like, let's say post enlightenment, rational, like utilitarian maxing world. So mm -hmm. a lot of the question of a lot of the question of like, what is the role of the artist in terms of fine art is complicated because now the people who, um, in terms of like just people's aesthetic um, enjoyment, most of it comes from the graphic design world now or animation or mm. so forth. It comes from very like utilitarian heavy art mediums that are like basically, you know, putting advertisements in the public space and all that. But in terms of the importance of the artist, it's because um, I kind of always default to like the Heideggerian notion of the artist reveals a world to people and the artist is someone who makes a clearing for the world itself and the revealing of being itself and truth, hopefully. But when it comes to the question of beauty, um, I, I differ from a lot of uh, the typical analysis of that people have in these spaces, because I feel that you have to take even what people consider quote unquote ugly um, seriously, because ugliness mm. is a great sort of, um, it's a great barometer of truth in the sense, even like the, the greatest works of art, if you were to look at even what like trads would like quote unquote trads would consider mm -hmm. like great skill, like Daumier or uh, Goya or Fran. I mean, they probably hate Francis Bacon, but like, let's say um, even um, Tiepolo, if you actually look closely, a lot of it has incredibly demonic ugliness to it. I mean, literally, I mean, literally demonic in that the pictures of hell that they depict, right? Um, I think like that's the big misconception is that beauty. I, I don't want beauty itself to become like another commodity where it's like, well, okay. What they're producing is ugliness, like flat design, for instance, by the way, show it to my friend, Eli Schiff. Um, it's so now it's like, we have to like produce based in trad art, but to do <laughs> that, like I, I, I'm actually, it's funny. We wanted to talk together because I'm writing this um, article for the passage prize that mm -hmm. Lomez is doing. And I'm a judge, actually. Mm -hmm. I'm judging the visual art. <laughs> um, so I I was writing about how it, I, I use this analogy with, you know, that saying from Marx, um, religion's the opium of the masses. You know that saying? Mm -hmm, um, yeah. Yeah. So usually what Marxoids, what they do is they, they cope by saying that, you know, Marx, and I had a professor explain this once. Marx isn't exactly saying like, oh, religion sucks. Like it's just mind control, man. He's saying like <laughs> religion is a barometer for people's suffering. But of course, behind that is like an assumption that it's bullshit and that um, it's false. And, you know, cause he was an, he was an atheist materialist. Right. So in what I say is that ugliness is kind of like the opium of the masses in the sense that it reveals a greater suffering to, to being itself. It reveals, a great suffering of the modern world. So I think like mm. the, that's the problem with when people talk about beauty, because 
in one sense, yes, it's true. Beauty is an objective property. We can, on a gut level, we know in our soul what is beautiful. But then we say, okay, why is there the subset of people that worship quote unquote ugliness? Why is it that they think that political representation equals an uglification of reality? Mm. That's my question that I think a lot mm. of people miss. So, sorry, I'm just rambling right now. No, no, no. It's interesting stuff because at the end of the day, uh, when you are discussing the topic of there needs to be more uh, artists that uh, aren't just uh, the, the typical garden variety leftist or liberal, you have to start asking about what type of art would you then like to see? I mean, if you're mm -hmm. encouraging people to create art, what type of art would actually have a positive impact in the world and what would just be a, an empty gesture? And I think that's why it's important to have these conversations about like, is it as simple as just saying, well, you just should just create beautiful art? I mean, that's a, that's a very simple answer and it might even yeah. lead you astray. And I think that's why this is a very important thing that you're touching on where there is a lot of debate surrounding what is beauty itself and what does really uh, what qualifies as good and great art in the end, art that will be remembered in 100 years. Exactly. Because the art that will be remembered in 100 years, I think um this is okay so i think the the basic critique is that the societies that produce um beautiful artwork they have a f sort of different um let's say conditions from which that art can grow they have a sort of uniqueness about them that is i would say not impossible but highly improbable in our like globalized internationalist like uh let's call it global homogenous uh, world mm. and so i think that the problem is for like dissident artists who actually want to create something meaningful you're going to have to sort of deal with the conditions of this like sort of growing like um what does our friend alex kashuda call it the gray goo of the world mm, of, mm. like this the massification so yeah. why is yeah. it that certain aesthetic styles are so prominent in the public consciousness from advertisements and uh, billboard designs and just like the just hideous commercials of like blob people like dancing in the get up commercial <laughs> like <laughs> yeah i you know what i mean like i think th there's yeah. a much deeper question there than just like using good um just like by using good aesthetics as like a bludgeon for political ideology like that's mm. that 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 would kill art more than anything because if if there was like a based like trad equivalent of i don't know soviet realism then it's like what's the point you know what i mean <laughs> yeah. yeah no i get it um but yeah before we continue I'm actually too curious now. I mean, I, I need to get into this topic of okay, the, yeah. the South African uh, art scene that you wanted, that you it did relates. some research on. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to be rolling out the, the red carpet for you. Don't be ashamed of uh, rambling. I want to okay. want to get this information. Um, so let me know. What, what did you discover? How did you go <laughs> down this rabbit hole? Well, I, I noticed a lot of different um, discourse around how South Africa was created through your work and through others. And I was mm. actually before this, speaking of Alex Kashuda, our good friend, I was actually listening to your talk with her and um, I forget the name of the other gentleman. Um, Robert Dygan. Yeah, yeah, Robert Dygan, yeah. And you were talking about how the fiction of South Africa in the modern world was created. And when you mm. look at it, the professional art world at the time from the, I would say, late 70s to the 80s, especially in the 1990s, post-apartheid, that was, to me, cementing this internationalization of the art world itself, but also of South Africa, because mm -hmm. South Africa was the great experiment. Right. So before I, before I um, go on, let me just say that there is a lot of South African artists who are of immense quality and who, even though they might not be of the sensibilities of quote unquote trads, I think has a value. Like for example, the absolute star, like the stars of the South African art world, like David Kalani, um, who else am I thinking of here? Um, like, like there's Kalani, there's William Kendrick is like, like William Kendrick's like the, the God, right? So, <laughs> um, there was a few events that happened in the eighties and nineties, especially post apartheid when the formation of South Africa was being created in terms of an ideological concept instead of the reality on the ground, like the stuff that you're talking about with, it's mm. not simply black and versus white. It's the, the, the ethnos of South Africa is very complex. Right. So the, the one event, there's two, there's two things. Okay. One would be the Medu assemble, the Medu group. 
um, MD, uh, how does it go? M E D U, the Medu group. They were a mm -hmm. collection of international artists in the eighties that were taking like Soviet style, um, social realist posters and like silver Lake period stuff. And a lot of like Americanized art forms from like various graffiti activism. And they were bringing it to South Africa and, and they were basically creating like propaganda agitprop posters through the art world in these galleries, right. especially the Goodman Gallery. The Goodman Gallery is like the ground zero, right? Um, <laughs> and, and a number of people um, from America, especially of a certain, um, let's call it like, let's say they're Jesuits in terms of, <laughs> anyways. Um, so they were importing a lot of Americanized, internationalized um, racial grievance politics at the time um, into South Africa a lot of it had connection to the Black Panthers. And let me preface again, saying that a lot of this artwork was good. Um, of course, the Black Panthers are a mixed bag. Like a lot of the stuff that they wanted was kind of like based in red pill, like autonomy for certain <laughs> ethnic groups. Like like even the guy, like um, who is the guy? Um, was it Eldridge Cleaver that became like a Reaganite after when he was talking about- <laughs> I'm not like, too familiar with that history. Yeah, there was a leader of the Black Panthers um, who was like going on uh, w William F. Buckley's show firing line and talking about minecrafting Richard Nixon. Then he became like a Ronald Reagan guy. So, um, but anyway, so the Medu group was one, another big important event, which they called the Biennale of the nineties was the second Johannesburg Biennale in 97. That is when you had um, Enzor and a bunch of other American artists importing a lot of art styles into South Africa post apartheid. And let me act, and it was organized by Art Forum. Art Forum is like the absolute like pinnacle of like if you're accepted, you know, because they're the ones that put mm. on all the great biennales. Like the Venice Biennale is like the WrestleMania of the art world. So let me read you an excerpt from uh, Art Forum really quickly. To say that the second Johannesburg, B sorry, am, am I, I'm mispronouncing it. It's Johannesburg, right? Yeah, um, Johannesburg. Yeah, yeah. To say the second Johannesburg Biennale is uh, tied to post-apartheid is to acknowledge South Africa's new position in Africa and the world. The theme of the Biennale, created by Okwani and Suarzo, um, and and Wurzor, I'm, I'm mispronouncing it, an international team featured some 160 artists from 63 continents. Um, trade routes, history, and geography was the theme. Some of the subtitles in the show, such as Altering Currents and Transversions, reveal the show's preoccupation with hybridity, metisage, globalization, narratude, mm. as they say in, in France. Um, the electric workshop of the core exhibit was a haven for video, computer, and other technology-based installations that left the door wide open. Then it said from a number of artists from America, Europe, Asia, and Latin America, to the detriment, according to many of the African artists working with sculptors, painters, and other traditional media. In the context of post-apartheid nationalism, the internationalist focus was viewed as an instance of cultural imperialism and justifiable, justifiable grounds for South African audiences to isolate themselves from the Biennale. So here we have the professional art world is something to be paid attention to because they were in large part bringing a internationalist version, but more importantly, an Americanization of South African politics and mm. cultural life to the continent. And so you have this sort of like dichotomy between the evil racist. Oh, it seems like, uh, Gio's frozen. There. I don't think people it's, uh, oh. Oh, there he's back. No, you yeah, just you, uh, you just uh, roboted out there for one second. So uh, you oh, can continue I was, there. I was yeah, saying you, that it was like an Americanization. Am I good now? Hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, I got yeah, that. Yeah, it, it was like what you were saying in terms of an Americanization of politics. This hmm. comes from the professional art world because there was two forces. There was the pro art world, the contemporary art world, and then there was. Um, of course, the sort of Hollywood-based culture industry. So what mm. got rid of apartheid? It was it was Coca-Cola. Oh, my cat Gertrude just climbed on me. Um, it was the, it was Coca-Cola. It was U2. It was uh, Bruce Springsteen. And so what we have is the sort of pushing and creation of a totally new society from its aesthetic and cultural output. And so this is why South Africa, like you, like you were saying in the talk, um, 
like that quote from Nick Land about like you know the the micropolitics of the world is in South Africa, and of course he was writing that when he was. Yeah, well, the uh, I said in the interview that if Afghanistan is the graveyard of empire, South Africa is the laboratory of empire. Yeah, and I come from a nation that's pre- well, I would say post nation according to our leader <laughs> Justin Trudeau, that um, <laughs> is also a laboratory of nations. Mm. Or um, so I I think that in terms of how globalization in terms of culture and aesthetics and the work of art is Americanization. There's no better example than South Africa in the eighties and nineties. That was like the ground zero Mm. of where the professional art world in that sort of post um, cold war Malay, like that post cold war celebration of like, you know, the opening up of the world and the mosaic society, the professional Mm. art world, they looked at South Africa in particular as like, this is our Petri dish. We are going to like, you know, now, like for the first time since the 60s, you know, when Andy Warhol it, it killed the avant-garde um, for the first time ever, the, the art world now has the significance and importance politically. So and, mm. and so South Africa was unfortunately the victim of like internationalist <laughs> artists everywhere. So, yeah. Yeah, because you're aware that the whole statue toppling thing started in South Africa, right? Exa- yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. And, and I mean, I was in university when that started. Um, so I oh, was man. in the in the Petri dish when that shit was going down. Um, and yeah, no, I mean, this is what's, what's happening is that when you look at South Africa, things are experimented here first before it gets exported. For example, the, yeah. this whole idea of giving a, a COVID relief to um, uh, specific racial groups and giving uh, having a, a demographic element when it comes to COVID relief, that was pioneered in South Africa. Yeah, um, that's the type of shit that they try here. So, um, yeah, I know South Africa is definitely the place to be watching. And as I always say, if you if you could get a glimpse into the future, why would you deny it? Exactly. But I but more importantly, I think even in terms of style and in terms of art practice, there is a lot of um, there is a lot of nuance to a lot of um, Zulu and other artists in particular mm. um who had a like rich history a rich aesthetic tapestry to go from mm. but unfortunately what happened was they are the, the sort of artists and the works of art that get promoted in international biennales either in Paris or in New York or in Vienna um they're the ones that more or less adopt a very like Americanized like post-colonial form of like neo-primitivism that you would see people um artists like jean michael basquiat for instance yeah um, but that makes that makes perfect sense marginalizing those more uh uh, indigenous south african art like for example uh, zulu art falls into for example that quote uh that i always use from samora Machel, the first president of mozambique who said for the nation to live or for the nation to survive the tribe must die Exactly. So David Kalani is a good example. And he actually um, recently, when he passed, he had a good write up in the New York Times uh, because I like, guess as, as incredibly like, you know, shit lib as it is, the New York Times, the art, arts and life section does have occasional bangers. Um, he had to adopt more of like a, I would say 1930s Harlem Renaissance, like expressionist style. Mm. But he along the way sort of adopted a lot of the uh, like native indigenous uh south african art along the way but the way he had to do it the way he had to sell it to the new yorkers and the gallery the jesuit gallery owners is that um, he had to like basically create an american racial politics within his artwork in south africa um mm. I, I wouldn't say that's an entirely unfair assessment of his work because a lot of his work was very transformative um but it's just like that's the unfortunate reality with every artist that comes from quote unquote post a post colonial context is that they're inevitably mm. going to have to sub- submit themselves to a very heavily Europeanized and Americanized um, like literary department version of post colonial art. So it's like mm. they have to take the concepts in themselves, uh, and it's yeah, and unfortunately yeah. the work of art itself it loses out so. and it's the same thing with politics as well now you can see in south africa specifically like all these afro nets and like black nationalists and black socialists they're so all heavily europeanized uh in yeah. their ideologies and their views there's nothing organic or african about it it's all just taking stuff from uh, just uh <laughs> <laughs> anti-colonial ideology but anti-european yeah. and anti-christian ideology and appropriating it for african context but there's nothing 
African about it. There's no going back to their traditional roots. There's no going back to let's go do research on what our societies were like before colonialism. Yeah. Let's go see what our systems were like. Let's see how culturally we manage these types of things. No, they actually look down on their cultural heritage as they look at it in disdain. They look down on it as backwards, illiberal. They look down on it as something yeah. from the past. And they want now they want Wakanda with flying cars. They don't <laughs> want, for example, the, to, to look back at the past and say, well, let's see what is beautiful in the past and let's use that to build the future. Uh, rather, they want this weird neo-futurist view that they think is uh, has African elements to it, but has nothing of the sort. It's just yeah. wearing African culture like a skin mask. <laughs> exactly. And I think you've even hit upon, um, even within academia, a lot of the criticisms of Afrofuturism, which South Africa, as you know, as you're describing, is the, basically the heart. I mean, there's other places like, um, there's other cities even like Nairobi, but usually South Africa is. Oh, considered... our president wants to, he, he very <laughs> likes to talk about promising building smart cities and bullet trains yeah. and these cities of the future, yeah. very shiny and chrome. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. Because like a lot of um, Afrofuturism came from largely European discourses of people mm. like Franz Fanon be coming to the West, coming to Europe mm. and like taking the lessons of like French existentialism, for instance, then later with the futurist writers, then even later with like accelerationism, you have again this like weird amalgamation of what is like I would say an aesthetic appropriation or sort of like a cargo culting of like what um a lot of tribal based African aesthetics were like and taking it like, well now we're gonna put like a bunch of um, you know, art world technology on it. We're gonna like take a <laughs> Nam June Peck computer image display like installation. Yeah. That's gonna be Afrofuturism because as long yeah. as black people um like as long as there's the black body in the background with the technology, therefore yeah. it's Afrofuturism. Yeah, so. and there's some beads. No, yeah, it's, uh, there's beads it's really yeah. very superficial. It's it's not organic. It's something that yeah. it's it's almost like if you were to condense it, it's like a European pretending to be like an Afro nationalist. <laughs> Yeah, They're like yeah. trying to envision a future that he thinks Africans want. That's the best way I can describe it. And, and I hate to say, it. oh, go ahead. Sorry, no, no, sorry. Okay, no, I just wanted to say it's it's so far removed from reality and it has no <laughs> roots anywhere in like deep culture and deep lore of Africa. It's all this very, very new stuff, less than 50 years old. Yeah. And unfortunately, I would say that um, as, as much as I appreciate uh, Orientalism or so forth, I think that there is a sort of um, exoticism as old as like time itself, as old as at least till the age of colonialism, where you have primitivism, you have art brut, and you have other styles where they get like European artists get sort of like, um, let's call it the British Museum interpretation of what African art is. And mm. so then they take like, for example, Picasso is like the best example of like taking mass from South Africa and elsewhere and sort of mm. like, whatever he like saw vaguely in like, you know, a museum and putting that in, and like ostensibly creating art for the past, like after his lifetime, the next like 50 to 60 to hundred years, obviously. I mean, but unfortunately a lot of the authenticity of such artworks gets lost in, in translation. And so now you have, even when in, in, in America you have, uh, you know, a lot of the sort of ideology that came about, that the art world took up from the black Panthers from black liberation movements. They have like a very like garbled view of what life is actually like and what cultural life is like within Africa. And the art world replicates this because mm. like you have people that are like, Oh, why can't we move back there and blah, blah, blah. Like go back to the motherland. But when you have like, you, you know, like, like black people in America, they're they're basically American. They're just American. Mm. Like they've been no, they're, they're longer they're much than more Westerners people. than Africans. Exactly, and they've some of them have been there longer than white people, obviously. Oh. So it's um it's very difficult to talk about these things because, on the one hand, like contemporary like woke discourse like destroys everything, but there is there's kind of like seeds of validity to like when people talk about cultural appropriation, for instance, the way they frame it, like having, I don't know, a, a costume of like, um, uh, uh, like what was the one, uh, the university I went to, it was like a costume of like a, uh, Viet Cong soldier. Uh, it's like, 
that's kind of stupid and ridiculous, but the heart of that is true in that when you sort of are incredibly distanced from these cultures that you're taking from that organic cultural diffusion, it's complicated and it can't really take Mm. place in terms of an authentic expression. Right. Mm. So like even just the way that aesthetic styles develop over time organically, um, it's, it's difficult nowadays, I would say, because we have access to so much media, because we have sort of an mm. infinity of like, you know, Googling what different styles and different artworks look like around the world. It's almost like the artist nowadays can only be an eclecticist because there there's like this pantheon of images. It's like if I wanted to do Afrofuturism, it's like, you know, let me Google what Zulu art looks like. So it's like, yeah, it becomes very difficult to have mm. that sort of genuine engagement nowadays mm. more than ever because it's like the 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 sort of the fluidity of the image has been gone within its infinity within the infinite amount of information the the sacredness of the image is sort of like lost on us so mm. yeah. and uh, there's a theme that uh, every most of the stuff that we've talked about touches on but i haven't we haven't touched specifically on this question and that is how does art influence culture specifically what what dynamic is going on there hmm. It's difficult to say because influence is complicated in the sense that mm. the the work of art informs a culture, but the work of art also brings a mirror to that culture. Mm. So in the act of mirroring what is underneath, um, that is where you get the genuine sort of creation of culture and society itself. But the, unfortunately, the problem is when this isn't like a perfect sort of like conveyor belt relationship because in any time period, the work of art becomes subservient to the predominant narrative at the time. And the sort of picture that a lot of artists have of like, well, I'm transgressing society, man. Like it's, yeah. that's my bullshit. art is subversive. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's bullshit because a lot of the art that was subversive was sort of like, the stuff that the people at the top are going to accept anyways, but it was just like ahead of its time. Mm -hmm. So like, it's very complicated to even use such romantic language of how art creates culture and society, because the relationship there is complicated in itself. So there generally is outsider artists. There are people who Mm -hmm. are genuinely transgressive, but their transgression is usually I would say happenstance and second order and like comes about purely like without thinking about it. Because if you are Mm. like, this is always going to be the problem with activist art in general is like when you're consciously thinking of like, I'm transcending the boundaries, man, I'm like really critiquing society. Like we live in a society. It's like, that's, (laughs) (laughs) I think people can see through it. And unfortunately I think Mm. this is not like, um, this is not like unique to the political left. This is also like a right wing thing as well, because like, Mm. The greatest like artists on the right that had like, you would say like quasi fascistic tendencies, right? Like think of like Ezra Pound, for instance, a lot of that like, wasn't um, like to think of art as like a conscious propaganda tool. Like, I think that's mm. unfortunately the bane of like a lot of discourse around art itself, because nowadays politics almost is like the currency by which an artwork gains legitimacy. And so like, we obviously can look at any contemporary art gallery and there's a lot of good things. Like there's a lot of things being produced that are decent, even like the total, like, like leftoid, like, like libtarded type of stuff. Some of it can be quality, but we can look at like the activist part of his being ridiculous. But unfortunately Mm. that never transcends to like, it's not like, Oh, it's not a matter of like creating art for its own sake. Obviously that's a unique, like ideological thing. But it's more of like creating art in in for in sort of um in a way in which it becomes expressive and authentic onto itself, not like mm. I'm creating it for this other ulterior goal of like right. subversion or whatever. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No. I uh, I can't remember who said it, but I once uh, listened to one of the uh, yeah was it I, I'm almost I almost want to say it's Jordan Peterson, but I'm also not sure. But anyway. This guy was talking about how you write a story, how you write fiction. And he said, you don't, 
start off the story by thinking i want to write a story with the message of don't do drugs if i want to write a story yeah. about be yeah. a good person or i want to write a story about uh, don't judge people you write a story and you create realistic characters with solid characters and solid backgrounds and solid uh, uh, attributes and then you have those characters interact with each other and the story it will come uh, come forward by itself yeah exactly like that that is i think what separate and and like even when there is a conscious message there i mm. feel like if if the work of art is good enough on its own and by good mm. i mean it's effective um it's mm. it's something that sort of pulls pulls at you yeah. then i i feel like um <laughs> this the sort of like obviousness of its political message can be tolerated yes, more uh, than Sorry to interrupt you, Dr. Yeah, yeah. Rikarizrach. It was uh, Jonathan Pagjaw that said that. Oh, yeah. Oh, um, yeah. And the, the other interesting thing is, I think the difference, to demonstrate that difference, is it's the difference between paint, having a painting of a beautiful town and a painting of a blonde lady running through a field of wheat. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so that's the difference. Um, that is but yeah, um, and before we continue, just while I'm looking at the chat, there's another one I wanted to highlight. Uh, the image bear says in the immortal words of Fokov Polisikar, was Amalwerk Samen Afrikaans America. So Fokov Polisikar is a punk band in South Africa that oh. had a very big cultural impact. And one of their lyrics, it goes, uh, we're all working together to, uh, towards Afrikaans America. So Afrikaans is the language I speak yeah. and the language yeah. that Afrikaners and Boers speak. So that lyric is very ingenious. <laughs> Pretty much there in early 2000s, they already identify that all us young Afrikaners are just building Afrikaans America. Yeah, oh <laughs> here God. in South Africa, that's pretty much. It's like that <laughs> Ramstein song about we're all living. We in all live in America. It's one Dubai. Yeah. Um. Oh man, that's crazy. Cause it's it's funny how um, a lot of like uh, this was like, I wasn't a part of it, of course. Emic criticisms, but. Um, the OG uh, alternative right back in the day, they had the term mm. Americaner, and I felt oh, like yeah. that was pretty clever. Like, like that and the qua thing, like that, that was clever because it's indicative of like the largely like deracinated white population in like North America, and it's like now we are the new Afrikaners, and it's like, <laughs> but but it's it's so crazy though because again, it's like popular culture. They really like cemented the narrative of like like these you know white people in south africa like it's like i remember my old man was doing a job once and um he was doing a driveway for this uh couple that recently migrated like immigrated here to canada from south africa white couple and africana right and so um he's like oh you have an accent in south africa right and so they were talking a bit and they're like oh my god thank god that you understand because because people uh, like an Afrikaner it's like that you are a racist and like you're an evil person mm. that probably oppressed, you know, some, somebody like that's literally what they think. Like, as soon as you say that you are an Afrikaner, it's like ignoring that history of like British colonialism and all of that. Right. Like it's, there's no nuance whatsoever. And it's like, mm. you know what I mean? It's, it's very tragic in a way, but unfortunately it's because the culture industry in North America really helped to cement that. It was Hollywood. It was like pop culture that mm. like more than anything helped not only bring down apartheid, but like hang this like yoke of eternal, um, like eternal guilt and shame upon the heads of every Afrikaner. Mm. Like that's, you know, well, that's, uh, that's pretty much what I, uh, what I wrote in my latest opinion piece where I wrote about, uh, origin myths and the, the Afrikaners mm. and the West struggling with their origin myth. And I mean, what you're talking about there is people building a new toxic modern origin myth. And I mean, if you're yeah. toxic, if your origin myth is toxic, then uh, you have no other choice than to be compelled to, uh, make sure that you're not, your people don't exist anymore in the future. Where your culture is wiped out but at the same time uh, there's also a, an interesting thing where afrikaners still today are very much involved in creating art whether that art yeah. be literature or writing or music it's always been this drive of there's the there's this great quote from uh, uh milan kundera where he says um the only uh, only small nations understand having a question mark over the, over your very existence every day of your life. Yeah. A large nation yeah. always takes their their future 
being uh, their future uh, being secure for granted, while a small nation doesn't know if their culture is going to exist in 50 years. And that's where Afrikaners actually are a very good case study of Afrikaners. They, our very existence as a culture has always been characterized by this anxiety that we're going to be, uh, our culture is going to die out within the one, next generation. Yeah. And you could see that, I mean, it's a, there's a very good reasons why that, that idea persists. I mean, the, the, firstly, you live in a very dangerous continent. Secondly, yep. uh, the <laughs> British tried to anglicize us multiple yep. occasions. Uh, and it's up until this today, you still see that in Afrikaners constantly creating music, create writing, creating art, but with a very strong cultural element and a language element to it, almost as of that, that attempt to keep the culture alive and rejuvenated, that it doesn't uh, rot, almost like a, a appendage where you cut off the circulation to it and it just dies. You just keep that circulation is keep creating cultural goods if i can use that word oh yeah even like uh the south african metal scene is going pretty strong from what i hear <laughs> so um that's uh <laughs> i think like it, it's very interesting because like usually from my like from my studies if you go to any like um like art documentary place like uh art 21 or brilliant ideas yeah. which bnn runs like all of the artists they tend to pick from South Africa that talk about colonialism, that they're largely like British descendant artists. Like I hate to say, right. I hate to stereotype, but like <laughs> the most shit lived, like the most libtarded ones tend to be British, obviously. <laughs> um, and, and so there's like that rich history of Afrikaner art and culture that tends mm. to get buried because it's almost like, it's almost like the way national galleries treat orientalist paintings as like, this is mm. evil and dangerous. Don't touch it. It's like, damn, yeah. you know? it's evil. It's seeds of evil. If we even expose it to a little bit of sunlight, it might grow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and, and I think that's, that's, I, uh, again, the, I can't like tell you how, Im how important it is to look at what's happening right now in South Africa, yeah. but also looking at its art and its culture and its media to really like look at, um, like, like you were like Kundera, for example, you, you mentioned him, he had like an amazing, mm. um, article. I, I would even think above Scruton's analysis of the work of kitsch in the art world. Right. Mm. Um, so maybe, he, uh, before we continue, just elaborate yeah. on uh, kitsch. For the okay. Audience. Yeah. It's, it's one of those, like, it's like postmodernism. What can you say? Right. Um, mm. the way that Kundera formulated it, it's almost like it's similar to Scruton in that it's artwork that is contained within a world on its own that has mm. like no relevance outside of itself, but also it's subsumed to the forces. It's like beholden to the forces of commodification and so forth. And it's really like enclosed within its own, like aesthetic picture, meaning that it's just itself a work of art. It has no mm. other like larger, um, it doesn't create a world beyond its own confines. That's basically, mm. I think what he was saying. Um, mm. So like, but anyway, I mean, yeah, just to, just to lay yeah. that foundation. Yeah. Please continue. Yeah. Like, I mean, kitsch is of course a word that gets thrown around a lot. Like there's even yeah. artists, you know, like um, the famous example being like Jeffrey Coons who like, takes it and like ironically like yeah i'm doing kitsch ironically with like an <laughs> army of artisans at his disposal mm. um but so i i think like um when it comes to that what was i going to say i mentioned Kundera. um when it comes to that reality of an for the first time ever i feel like that distinction has been problematized of like smaller nations always question their own um, existence and their own purpose. I mean, I come from a country where we have no purpose and we have no um, collective identity or rather we did at one point, but um, the guy who's in charge, his daddy basically destroyed it. I'm of course referring to Pierre Trudeau. Um, mm. And so if you, if you read, there's an amazing book you have to read everyone because it's relevant to the world, not just Canada, but George Grant's book, Lament for a Nation um, where mm -hmm. he talks about like American neoliberalism, basically like destroying Canada's identity. Um, I think for the first time ever, not the first time ever, it's obviously happened before at the end of every empire, but it seems that even bigger nations are, we're going into a mode where we are also questioning ourselves. Like America, for instance, is in that mm -hmm. space where now more than ever they're questioning their, their future and their relevance 
because it, it's almost like I would say the British Empire near the end, like near the first and second mm. world war, where it was like, where do we go from here? Because for like the, the let's say an English man in Victorian England, the thought that they would question their future would almost be ridiculous. Would it not be right? Like questioning their purpose and their role in, in the world in the future that would seem ridiculous to a Victorian Englander. Mm. But by the time World War One rolled around, that question became more apparent. And then, of course, right. I mean, for example, the recent, um, and I know he's like he's like a libtard himself, but like the Adam Curtis documentary, it's called, mm. um, it's like the three-parter one. I forget its title. It's the more, most recent Adam Curtis documentary where he talks oh, about yeah. how- Oh, no, yeah, I haven't watched that, yeah. Yeah, I watched it. Me and Lev watched it. We would talk about it in a Break the Rules. Um, it, he was talking about how immigrants from the empire, from from Kenya and from other mm. places, they would go to Britain and like, and of course, it's like typical shit lib stuff of like, they found a scared and racist population who used the racism to lash out at the fact that they lost their empire. Mm, mm, mm. But but within it's kind of true in that the sort of like tame and demure state of Britannia post empire where they were f fearful of their own future of like where yeah, you 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 know yeah. went from controlling om almost a third of the world to controlling an island the size of Michigan. Ex <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? But that's even a, when it, that's a pretty big culture shock. It, no, but exactly and I think that um th there were some people like they were like um like for example Mark Fisher who was friends with Adam Curtis before he unfortunately, you know, um and he wrote, uh, he had like this thing about like Britain in the seventies in terms of aesthetics and culture being mm. like, now there's new possibilities post empire. We could build from this. We can create acid communism. Right. But then <laughs> there is, you know, but the, but the more like the more like lib. And so, you know, uh, Mark Fisher, of course, was, you know, fame infamously canceled from his, you know, perch and goldsmith because he wrote that essay, um, exiting the vampire castle. Um, so he, he called out the vampires and he got bit for it. Right. So, but it's funny cause Adam Curtis being more of like the shit lib, he almost mm. had more of an accurate picture of what Britain was like in terms of the culture and the media and what they were producing at the time was reflective of this inner fear and uncertainty. And so when you look at the cultural output of America now, you're, you're starting to see it. Right. But mm. how does this relate to other places? And especially is how South Africa, because it seems that it relates even more so to South Africa, because all of those sort of the neuroses of empires that decline, uh, it seems that like that is like the pull from which it it goes towards. Yeah. So you and know, that's South the Africa, thing, people. Yeah, yeah uh, finish that thought. No, I was just going to say that like post apartheid, the creation of what South Africa is now, that was almost like the final end of the British and sort of the crescending of the American empire. Now in terms of culture and art and the work of art, now that becomes this like last gasp of vitality saying we're going mm. to oppose this libtardive version of reality on the world in South Africa. And we're, it's like this last sort of kick at the can of our relevance. Right. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, I mean, South Africa, believe it or not, is pretty much an empire. The, the creation of South Africa, if you look yeah. at the, how large South Africa firstly is, how many different cultures are within it. We have 11 official languages. That's not a country. Yeah. That's an empire. Um, and then also, uh, before I forget, when you mentioned Kitsch, I remember there's this one American artist that everyone knows, um, uh, Thomas Kincaid, <laughs> that I was thinking about. Did you watch my video, <laughs> Thomas Kincaid? I don't think it's I on, did. Um, it's on my YouTube channel, uh, Jenner Productions at YouTube.com. Um, mm. I, I had this thing called uh, Vulgar Tradism because... I saw a lot of like people on Twitter. They're like, "Oh yeah, Thomas Kincaid's actually based." <laughs> oh, no. oh no, 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 no! Like, um, I think like Thomas Kincaid. Um, I have more of a better opinion now. I think like I have more of a forgiving opinion because it's almost like um, it's like oh, it's funny because now is the season to do it. Um, my mother. <laughs> She, uh, every year around this time, she, like when she comes home from work, it's like nonstop, uh, Hallmark Christmas movies. Do you have those in South mm. Africa? 
the Hallmark no, movies. No, no, I don't watch television. <laughs> oh, thank God. Yeah. So like Hallmark, you know, the greeting card, they have like the, the channel, right? And uh, they have these like really kitschy, like Christmas movies that they produce like literally dozens of them a year. And they're all like the same plot. It's all very mm. much like, um, it's like middle-aged white women. That's what they watch. Right. Um, <laughs> so, and it's funny cause Thomas Kincaid, he actually produced a Hallmark Christmas movie <laughs> before he died. That seems far for the course. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So before he died, before he blew his head off on cocaine, um, and pills, he, <laughs> he had a lot of personal demons, by the way. Um, mm. he made this, he produced this Hallmark movie, Christmas movie. Um, so it's funny because I'll, like as much as I'm bummed out of the fact that this is like kitsch personified, right? Like it's like a Norman Rockwell painting, but a movie mm. it's, I remember the responses I got on Twitter was funny because they're like, yeah, but would you rather your mother watching some like latest Hollywood trash, right? Or these TV shows mm. that they produce now, like it's terrible. Right. Um, and I'm thinking of that. I think that's why, you see like revival in um like the right wing people will go towards Thomas Kincaid and like the hecking wholesome Reddit people will go towards Bob Ross because it's, <laughs> it's almost like that form of kitsch. It, um, it sufficiently sort of empties your mind of the sort of the current nightmare that we're living in together. And it's, mm. it, it, it sort of pulls you towards not just an idealization of life, but also like, it's, it's like, um, it's a good reprieve from like whatever um like like to have totally empty content content that's totally empty of any sort of um politics is like a transgressive act mm. nowadays right of course there's people that try to politicize thomas kincaid saying he was like um i think one art critic when he died called him uh the George, B it's funny because George Bush is a painter now, but they called him like the when before, before they, you know, the lefties, they had to retcon George Bush. Now George Bush is a good guy because he went after Trump, mm. right? Um, and he's, <laughs> he's a hecking wholesome painter who paints portraits of migrants now. He actually does this. Yeah. So, but, but back in the day, back in the early 2000s, when they fucking hated him, they thought he was the devil. Um, you have this one art critic saying that Thomas Kincaid is the George Bush of painting. He's like, the, he's like the imperialist American moral majority, like evangelical. <laughs> I mean, and he did like, he painted this mural for Billy Graham and stuff like that. So it's like Thomas Kincaid, I think for Americans in particular, for like people on the right, he's like the embodiment of like, um, like un unabashed American Protestant, like moral majority stuff that mm. is like deeply, deeply lost. It was destroyed during the 1990s. So I think that's why people love Thomas Kincaid nowadays. So. Yeah. So now there's a little bit of nostalgia. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and yeah, no, uh, Gio, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, I've, I've watched a few videos actually analyzing his paintings because they've actually made their way to South Africa as well. I do recognize oh, them. I've seen them in many houses. Um, oh. But. <laughs> Oh, the solar sands video, it, right? That was good. I guess yeah. that's also just the product of globalization and the Americanization across the world. That's the funny thing. We the the period of Americanization is done now. Now it's our turn. Now it's the period of South Africanization. So like, <laughs> oh, it's God. coming in, uh, it's coming full circle now. Um, we're, so, um, we're gonna live in the gated communities, and it's gonna take uh approximately seven years to fill um a a uh, elevator shaft with garbage. Apparently, that was that one four chan thread. It takes seven years for them to fill the fucking silo. <laughs> oh, so hilarious! The the last thing that I wanted to talk to you about, uh, or one of the last themes, and we can see where that goes as well, is we've talked about creating well views and arts and how people's worldview almost like i mean you've been using terminology as if there is progressive art and reactionary art and uh, liberal art, but maybe as someone that creates art and for those that uh, are not don't have that experience how does the artist's views and worldview really influence the what he uh, what he creates like how does that so how does that process work i i think i think like maybe 15 years ago it was easier to answer this question but nowadays it seems that there's almost like a necessity of like an artist to be political quote unquote, because mm. it's like a selling point. Um, but I think that 
art artists have always sort of been like at the margins of society. So therefore they will adopt um, a reactionary politics, either on the left or the right, ir irregardless. And there was a huge lineage of people on the right who were artists as well, but that have been like buried under history. Right. Um, because now the narrative is that, you know, like only, only people on the left can create the work of art. Right. So, um, but I think like how that process happens is always like, I really can't speak to like other people, but I, I do mm. notice a trend. I notice that there is a point in which an artist has to confront the fact that either they are going to reflect the world around them, or they're going to provide the means of escaping the world around them. And I mm. think that a lot of artists, like they have the decision. Like, I mean, there there's like a there's like mythologies that are built up around how artists become quote unquote radicalized like the best example being um and again an artist that i've struggled with for many years um in terms of liking or being repulsed by is like uh, picasso his thing about like um i think it was that bbc documentary that did it where he's like when the when the soldiers question me about guernica that's what i realized it's like in the spanish civil war that was kind of bullshit because he was always sort of like a bohemian communist to begin with. So it's like, mm. but it's a good selling point, obviously. And Guernica was a transformative work. I mean, the narrative about the Spanish civil war is obviously bullshit and obviously like terrible. And especially me as a Catholic. Right. Um, I think like the, the, the work of art itself of Guernica contributed a lot to um, as much as it's a great tapestry of Picasso's life and his influences from Spanish bullfighting to his experiences in the Spanish civil war. Um, I would say that uh, works of art like that have contributed to the narrative of like, you know, these hecking wholesome revolutionaries for, you know, and <laughs> American writers like Ernst Hemingway went to help these poor innocent communists. And it's like the mm. evil fascist Franco that got help from Hitler. But even though they were like murdering, nuns and and uh doing other you know sexual assault against nuns. i want to say it on youtube but you know uh against nuns and priests and all that stuff and uh, doing their own atrocities but i think like to answer your question again i think that there usually is never like a very like seamless transformation there between the artist's inner life and their own opinions and the work of art there's always sort of like a complication or an ambiguity. Like for example, mm. I mentioned William Kendrick who his big inspiration mm. was Goya. Like uh, in terms of printmaking, I am myself, I'm also a printmaker. Um, his inspiration from Goya's war series, he took that and he applied that to his experiences with apartheid in South Africa for right or for wrong. Obviously, of course, narratives, they get lost in translation, but there's a lot of ambiguity. I think to, for example, when Goya starts off the series of 80, he had this theory called, I think, the horrors of war, where um, there's 80 different prints and there's like three different groups. And from the beginning, it's very much um, it, it was it was when basically when Spain fought uh, Napoleon Bonaparte. Right. And there's mm. a lot of like terrible famine and atrocities and like literal peasant people like going after, um, you know, French soldiers with like uh, with with pitchforks. Right. So in the beginning, it's very much revealing the horrors and, and like the atrocities and how um, the Spanish soldiers, um, they were being defeated by these like hulking French monsters. But then near the end of the series, there's an ambiguity there because now you couldn't tell the difference between the peasant and the, and the French soldier and so forth. So it's almost as if like you can ascribe a political meaning to the work of art, but it's never going to be 100% unless you have like a total propagandist like you have um mm. that that feminist artist uh barbara kruger who uh has like those big mm -hmm. slogans those ironic um like oh, one right. of, yeah yeah like the one yeah. of them is uh the one i really like was called um like uh I, it was like this crude like hands off my pussy or something like that it was like mm. you know that kind of activist art like unless yeah, you yeah. Have, like unless you have that like it's very difficult to sort of pick apart the worldview like, like as much as people make this like romantic picture of like the artist is bearing his soul in his artwork mm. a lot of the times there is like there, there is a conscious decision to reflect what the artist is feeling and thinking but along the way like the work of art that's actually produced i think is like kind of few and far between because a lot of the times like for example when i'm doing a landscape painting you can ascribe a political meaning to it but a lot of the artwork that's produced, I think it's because 
the artist may like in, in passing, like see a subject or see something that's worth um, creating, right. That's worth mm. reflecting upon, but it's never like only after a huge period of time, like usually later on, does the artist like have the means by which to s- assess their own work of art and be like, okay, yeah, I can see a part of myself in that politically or, or mm. spiritually or whatever. Um, it's, I think people make too much of a big deal out of like, as an artist I'm creating. And and this is like, again, the problem with the contemporary art world is that like, as an artist, I'm creating this deep meaning and commentary. And, and we're going to unpack this relation between the colonial subject and the black body. Mm. Or whatever, right. So, right. Yeah. But uh, yeah, no, that makes sense. But then on that note, why then are there all these calls for, uh, for, for example, from people on the, the distant rights or people in uh, conservative circles or whatever, right. saying that the right needs more artists and to create more art. And they, I know they're talking within a, a political context. Uh, what, what's going on there? Um, a few things. One is that I think a lot of smarter people have realized the folly in um, – traditional quote unquote conservative or right wing or reactionary spaces of only emphasizing uh, victories within the political realm of only like Mm. producing um, academic work. And they realize that it's really um, the work of art itself that can inform people more deeply on things than if I were to write a 5,000 word essay. And, you know, I I do both obviously, but I think that, Mm. The problem is when you rely on political solutions only, there's a lot of different um, traps and there's a lot of different um, machinations of politics itself that can almost be counterintuitive to the goals of the political right. And so, and as much as political victories are good, I think that like, like, I know it's like a meme, like the Peter Thiel money or whatever, but it's like, (laughs) say if you did have someone who were, who were funding sort of, um, galleries or whatnot i think like that would be way more effective than just giving money to some political candidate because you really have to get at the sort of collective unconscious of a civilization and the only way effectively to do that in the absence of religion is the work of art right like for example a lot of um outsider artists or art brut or whatever that were um coming from the african continent a lot of their tribal artworks, they weren't easily fit into any ceremonial context in the West. So it was Mm. up to the, it was up to the art world to take up a lot of their um, rituals and and various other um, aesthetic activities and, and give it a context. And of course there's things that are lost in translation, obviously, because that's the problem with outsider art. I mean, there's a whole history of like, you know, outsider artists and like colonial post-colonial artists being exploited by these galleries and so forth. Right. But Hmm. you know, it's the same thing with, I think people on the political right, because we're so disenfranchised from the professional art world and from the culture industry itself, from the, the, the things that people see the most. Um, I think that there's a sort of push now to say, not only do we have to create our own institutions, but we have to do it in such a way that can be sort of, um, safe from subversion which is very difficult you know mm. that incredibly difficult because it's when it comes to like what's that third uh, the, the the law um conquest you know law where mm. an organization has to be explicitly conservative or also be subverted right um when it comes to the work of art like that's even doubly so more than anything because you can police political discourse but when it comes to aesthetic discourse that's even more harder because it seems that the right wing has been disconnected for a very long period of time from its own artistic traditions, from its own cultural um, discourses and activities, because there was a huge body of what we consider quote unquote right wing art. Right. But it's just that along the way we've been so severed from it that we're literally creating things anew. And so my worryment is that in creating these, um, aesthetic institutions if you will and creating these cultural institutions you're going to sort of like fall into the trap the way that the soviet realists or the way that Mm. other um artists of that other 20th century regime if you know what i mean in germany um you're going to fall into the trap of just using it as a means of propaganda because remember the here's the thing you have to read your enemies if you will if you read that essay by walter benjamin about um 
the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction, he has this distinction. And I always bring this up. The distinction between the left and the right is that with when it comes to um, left-wing aesthetics or communist, he was a communist, obviously. He was a messianic communist. Mm. He said like there was a politicization of the work of art. There was a politicization of aesthetics. So it's like the Soviet realists would come and they would take the work of art and they would politicize it. They would use it as propaganda. But he said he noticed with the fasc- fascist regimes, either from, um, you know, Germany to Italy to, to Spain, he called it the aestheticization of politics, meaning that mm. political activity itself, mass politics within a fascist regime becomes the work of art, right? So I yeah. think in a way, like you could say that, like, uh, it's like that quote from the, the movie Sallow, where it's like us, us fascists, the true anarchists, you could say that fascists are the true performance artists. In a way. <laughs> so, but, but I think like there was in 2016, there was kind yeah, well, of the whole society becomes performative. Exactly. There were people going out there. There were like 4chan nerds and going, going out there and like, you know, aesthetically subverting people by doing these elaborate performance like he will not divide us is like the best example it's funny because my friend um who writes for unheard mary harrington she wrote this article Mm. today about how um like how like all politics becomes performance art and uh, Mm. she mentioned me she's like i know i'm stepping on geo's toes a bit right but um no it's a great article go to unheard mary harrington because she mentions he will not divide us as like this weird kind of like participatory subversive performance art where it's like these mm. like 4chan needs go and like troll a Hollywood celebrity who is um, yeah and the being, thing is uh know. Shia LaBeouf's whole thing was a piece of art that he wanted to yeah. create but then the reaction from the internet was also a work of art exactly <laughs> like uh, it's funny because he, it's like a historical yeah. mythical epic if you recall it I mean, it feels exactly. like it happened a hundred years ago, but I, Even- it's always so fun <laughs> telling that story to people that are unaware. Oh man. No, but you hit the nail on the head. Exactly. A hundred percent. Like it's funny because Shia LaBeouf. Okay. He, um, he was up in this, uh, thing they call meta modernism, which I think is total bullshit. I think it's just liberal cope in my opinion. Um, I have reasons for that, but he was basically, um, align with a very terrible trust fund Tommy rich kid who tried to like buy his way into the art world, Luke Turner. And he, he was the one that doxed and harassed a number of artists. Some of them, my friends, actually my great friend, the art critic, Adam Lair was harassed. My good friend, DC Miller, the writer was harassed by him. Um, and he basically was, he like basically bought his way into the bosom of Shia LaBeouf. And they're like, you know what, Shia, you're a good artist. You're a meta modernist. Now you're, you're an artist, right? So he did that thing where, um, by the way, it was just ripping off Marina Abramovic, you know, the spear cooking, the, the satanic woman, uh, Marina Abramovic, right? She does the, the rituals, uh, Shia LaBeouf was ripping her off because she did this piece in the seventies mm-hmm. where Shia was like in this New York city apartment where he's got a bag over his head and you could do whatever you want to him. That was just <laughs> that where the, the bag says I'm not famous anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And like one <laughs> girl tried to like, um, like take his cock out and everything like it, <laughs> like that was just ripping off Marina Abramovic. <laughs> but, uh, I guess mm. his, his commentary was that, um, I'm no longer famous. I am just like this, uh, down in the dirt art uh starving artist right like it's all bullshit but um mm. i i just find it funny how the subversion of that performance is itself another <laughs> almost like weird <laughs> right wing performance art so um yeah, yeah. and you know it's 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 really something that i think will still be remembered in many many decades time it's really like oh, yeah. i said i always take great joy from telling that story in a condensed version to someone that doesn't know but i was there well i mean i was watching some of those live feeds live yeah. on the, the waiting for like things <laughs> to happen it was really an exciting time it comes from a a time that was a bit it feels like i said it feels like it happened 50 years ago oh yeah <laughs> it was a, a thousand it, centuries it, ago to cool <laughs> kernel currents oh, it's man. a it's a different time of the internet when that happened but yeah before i forget i saw our good friend the prudentialist gave a super chat and i don't want to uh let it get lost in the noise so uh the prudentialist gave a five dollar super chat thank you very much my friend and oh yeah says, my good friend aesthetics are also a reflection of one's culture and politics another reason for more artists yeah absolutely well thank you very much for that super chat and also for the thoughtful uh addition to the conversation through it now yeah while we're talking about that 
when it comes to creating art in any form, what uh, what do you think are the types of art that excite you the most? Of what types of art forms are coming to the fore? I mean, we t- we've talked about how internet shenanigans form a, a yeah. type of art. <laughs> no, but what, uh, what do you think? What does the art of the future look like? What is the art of uh, that you think will actually make a big impact and that you think are you, that you're actually excited about? Oh man, that's a huge question. I can't begin to answer because I'm thinking about it for that article for the Passage Press, but also I have this other article I'm writing about post internet post internet art. Um, I think that as time goes on, I think people are starting to uh, challenge the notion that every like artist has to be like a self contained unit, and they have to be sort of like a micro celebrity onto themselves. Um, Mm. like what the philosopher slaughter Dyke called the age of foam where like, there is no meta narratives anymore. There is just like end of history, neoliberal bullshit. So therefore every artist has to like create a new and a a good book. Actually I have it here. Um, he's another YouTuber that, uh, helped many people understand complex philosophic concepts. Have you heard of John David Ebert? Have you heard of him? Uh, no, I haven't. Come on, sir. Well, he, he, uh, I mean, he's going through some hard times now, but he wrote this book that changed my life. It's called art after metaphysics. And he talks Mm. about how, um, the artist in the age of post-modernity has to sort of collect the bricklage and the ruins of symbols. And he talks Mm. about a lot of like art that like a lot of trads would balk out. Like he talks about, um, Gerhard Richter and uh, my favorite artist, uh, Anselm Kiefer and other people. And uh, the art that excites me the most, I feel is going to be the stuff that is kind of like terminally like AFK away from keyboard offline there. I think that a lot of artists, um, they're going to return to a notion of like craft or like a genuine artistic practice. And I, because the problem is that you have a lot of like, quote unquote, like return to tradition art, like art yes. renewal center, that's kind of like almost kitschy in their own right. And like mm-hmm. what they're doing, like I, 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 I despise classical realism the way that they're doing it now, because to me it doesn't, it's predicating skill above actual like meaning. Right. So it's like, it's okay if you want to paint like Boucher or you want to paint like a uh, Tiepolo or whatever, but it's like, you're never going to like truly replicate what those old masters were thinking and feeling and doing. Right. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm more excited about, how people are going to start returning to craft and they're going to return to um, genuine printmaking and a lot of stuff that like, you know, libs on Tumblr were doing, but now like, it, it, like if you could wrestle away like craft from like libs on Etsy, then I feel like the right wing has sort of a chance. Um, but I'm always like fascinated by like what people, I guess would consider modern art, like abstract mm. expressionism and, uh, just like the, um, I was always influenced by the German expressionists more so than anything else. And uh, like here in Canada, of course, the group of seven, um, I think like there's a lot of potential for people to go back to the landscape painting proper. I think like there's a space for people um, appreciating the landscape more than ever. And even if you wanted to like package it in like a, like libtarded packaging of like, you know, the environment or whatever, like the po- post anthropocene art, like I, I think that's valid. You know, there's a lot of stuff to explore there. Um, mm. Even even though like, I and mean, even just like rest, like I think that art, the work of art could help the right wing um, wrestle environmentalism away from the shit libs. I think that could be a potential where say, if you have like another Hudson river school or another group of seven or a group of like distant artists who are actually like conscious of the environment, um, making like artwork in the vein of like Ted Kaczynski or someone, I don't know. Um, Cause to me, Ted Kaczynski was one of the greatest uh, performance artists of our time. Um, <laughs> I, I'm not fed posting. I'm not fed posting, please. I'm, <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean nothing by it, but if you check your mail tonight, don't worry about it. Um, so <laughs> no, I, I think that um, if you were to fuse landscape, various traditions of landscape painting with a more like um, reactionary form of environmentalism, there's a lot of grounds to be covered there. I think there's something mm-hmm. that could be had. Um, other than that, I think that um, the NFT thing is largely a fad and it's actually erasing the importance of the artist and the artwork itself, because 
I have my own, like I'm starting to firmly my critique of NFT art, but I think that like when it, when the work of art meets like financial baubles even more so than it is nowadays, um, it's not good in my opinion. It's not good <laughs> um, because like, like classic, you know, contemporary art, like being a financial instrument, um, it seems that the NFT market has accelerated that. And so I think artists mm. are probably going to have to um, look at themselves and be like, okay, do I just want to become a financial instrument where my work of art doesn't matter because it's, you know, like, like, look at these NFT, you know, the stereotype is like um, the monkey smoking weed with a rainbow flag in the background. Like it's, you know what I mean? Like, I think that, mm. Yeah, NFT. Someone says your NFT is performance art. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> oh my god, it's true. Um, I, I think like there could be a potential there. Like there certainly could be tools that the artist could use in like the internet age. But I feel that um, the people promoting like the crypto, like Silicon Valley bros promoting M NFT art, I think is uh, not good in my opinion. These aren't the people you want determining the aesthetic future of society. In my mm. opinion. <laughs> so you know. <laughs> Yeah, well, Gio, there's still a lot uh, that I want to talk to you about, uh, but unfortunately, uh, we've reached the end of our show now, uh, yeah. uh, time-wise. Uh, maybe just one final thing. Um, oh, the, the Onion Futures your... thing? Uh, oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. well, uh, I think I'll leave that for a future episode. Uh, yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> the future uh, I still have to write it to something. We'll talk about futurism. Yeah. Um, but maybe a final thing. Um, what would you want to be the big takeaway from these conversations like this where people are tuning in to listen to someone talk about art maybe it's something that they might, might not understand everything around it they might not be as immersed in the art world as you for example but what would you want ideally to be the takeaway from conversations like this for uh, pe the people listening uh people to buy my art no i'm kidding i'm kidding <laughs> um <laughs> but it would be nice um I, I'm I have to just like load merchandise onto this seller site I have. But I um if you want a work of art that I've done, like if you go to my Instagram, then just DM me. I try to respond, but mm. um uh when I when I finally like uh when I when I knock off my procrastination and like actually uh put up my website, it'll be different. Oh no, I think the main takeaway is that um I feel like if we have a deeper aesthetic education i then um we can start to think about our position in the world in a more um deeper and more mature way i think that if people realize that what they're viewing on a daily basis even if it's the most throwaway of illustration then i feel that um the you can grow to appreciate where we're at in life more than ever. Like you can see that even if you find something um, reprehensible and evil and disgusting and ugly, which I mean, let's face it, we're in a world of images that are evil and reprehensible and disgusting and ugly. Mm. But I feel that if you were to give like a sort of reflective view on that, then you can start thinking about things in a more productive way in the way that the work of art can deliver you and, and thinking about the work of art, not just appreciating it, not just liking something about it, but it's why you like something about it, why mm. it even makes you repulsed, repulsed by it. I think like if people were to have a slow view of it, the way that our ancestors did, the way that people that didn't have access to the infinity of images through the internet, mm. when you had to like, even the, the work of art that people saw on a daily basis was incredibly limited. Um, I think if you were to recreate the situation where you are forced to think about these things, then you could be more conscious and sensible about the fact that we are being aesthetically invaded in, in this world of empty and meaningless images, because that is the way it sort of rots the soul. In my opinion, if you have bad art, then you have a bad, you know, inner picture of the world. And so, uh, Mm. yeah that's my that's my view of it of course i'm mm. probably just like shamelessly selling my own purpose <laughs> for existing as an art critic and an artist <laughs> so you mm. know you have to be be aware of the source i may be biased so. <laughs> <laughs> no um, geo thank you very much it was a very interesting conversation you, I and i've this, put yeah. some uh i've put some comments from the audience on screen as well they seem to have really enjoyed it uh hardy dave yeah, is already asking for uh, uh to host you again for part two 
Oh, so yeah. I think we we will definitely be doing that in the new year. Uh, I think oh, yeah. there's two episodes of my podcast left before I'm done for the year. Um, so I think that's going to have to be in the in the new year. But I'm definitely going to have to do that because I still have an entire page of questions and topics here. Oh yes, we have get to do to. it. Early new um, year would be good. Um, yeah, there's a lot of exciting things coming up and break the rules as well. Um, mm. It's going to be busy. Yeah, speaking Christmas. of that, uh, let's get into the 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 show part of the episode. But All before right. we get into that, just one quick word from our sponsors. So uh, this episode is uh, sponsored by Bidvice. Uh, we've just been talking about a little bit touching on crypto. And uh, if you want to go into the crypto world and into crypto trading, uh, Bidvice is the place to go if you're in South Africa. Uh, seeing as uh, I know these folks personally, they help me set up all my crypto stuff and they really are genuine guys that will help you out. You can just send them an inquiry and they will be able to hold your hand through the entire process. I feel bad for um, bashing crypto nerds now. <laughs> Holy crap. I feel bad. No, these are, these are good guys. So uh, Bitvice is the, the only self-custody place to buy Bitcoin in South Africa. What that means is that if you buy Bitcoin through them, unlike any other exchanges, they never hold your Bitcoin for you. They send it straight to your own self-custody wallet meaning that regulators can't freeze your bitcoin and hackers can't steal it so there's a link to that in the description if you are south african and uh, you are still hesitant about getting into bitcoin you don't have to just you can just contact them and they will walk you through it and give you the pros and cons about it and i can see geo's cat has realized that the show is almost done <laughs> yeah, so yeah Gertrude. and there's a lot of people in chat asking uh, i see a uh, hardy da asks is geo on youtube and there was yes. another one uh, serge de novo asked what is the gentleman's name does he have a channel so firstly uh, his name is in the title of the the video or of the the stream geo panachetti and there's a link to his entire link tree in the description you'll see the geo's link tree if you go to yep. the description of the stream everything is there and uh if you click on that my there's YouTube a whole channel. list of every possible place yep my youtube channel my twitter um donation link you name it uh links to articles my archive um hopefully in the future, my art seller site, which I may do by December. Um, and yeah, uh, go to Jenner productions at YouTube. I have a bunch of stuff coming up. I have also Odyssey exclusives where things are a bit more spicier. Um, but yeah. in terms of my regular podcast, uh, I'm co-host and break the rules with love. Um, please give and that's us on subs. your link tree. Of course. Yep. Yep. We, our goal is to get 10 K subs. We're almost at eight K. So get 10 K by mm. uh, new year's. Um, we have a bunch of exciting guests coming up. I believe we're going to have, it's funny you mentioned Jonathan Paju because we're going to have a third time he's coming on. We're going to have a debate. I don't know how Lev gets these ideas. Christianity versus paganism. It's going to be Jonathan Paju versus sticks, hex and hammer on break the rules. <laughs> and this is I'll in December. <laughs> yeah. Um, and also I think we're going to have, um, we just set up an interview with the British guy who went to Afghanistan. Oh, so, uh, uh, Lord Nigel. Lord Nigel, <laughs> yes. We're going to have him. He's a based in Red Pilled Christian now, so it's going to be great. Mm. Um, next week, uh, I believe we're going to have the YouTuber Turkey Tom on with the YouTuber Glink. So um, it's going to be great. We have a bunch of stuff coming up. And also, uh, I think we have, before New Year's, we're going to have another few big guests so always mm. exciting stuff and break the rules no that's excellent and uh yeah i've been on your your sister podcast on like a smaller one i can't remember yeah, where, where it was art stream yeah right right yeah, yeah. so uh, maybe somewhere in the future i can feature on yours as well oh yeah so uh, we love that let yeah. me just check uh make sure i'm not missing anyone in the in the uh, chat so kevin morris says got it thanks Aaron. so he knows where your where your channel is and then also uh there was another one oh yeah hindo posted a link to your channel now, unfortunately you can't click on it on the screen but uh it is in the description yep. everything is yep. there you don't have to it's not going to take oh, any time to find uh, it i uh, so my recent podcast me and my buddy who is an excellent artist in his own right matthew the stout we do this um podcast on my channel called style talks where it's just about art and aesthetics and a recent episode uh, we usually critique things that we find objectionable, but um, our recent episode that just uploaded uh, last Monday was um, almost three hours. We're nerding off on the um, the the post metal band ISIS, their album Panopticon. 
So uh, if you're a fan of uh, ISIS, we talk about Foucault, Agamben, the uh, current uh, situation with the pestilence, you know, um, and it's, it's a really exciting stuff. Uh, and we mm. go through all the lyrics and everything. So, yeah, mm. check that out. All right. But, Gio, thank you very much uh, for thank your time. You, thank friend. you for a fascinating conversation. I really enjoyed it. And everyone's demanding a part two. So you guys can stay tuned oh, yeah. for next year for a part two, definitely. But, yeah, and finally also And you, you yourself, you my friend, you are doing amazing work. You are doing vital work in South Africa for your people. And I think mm. th that is so, to me, it's like hearing your story and hearing what you do uh to me that I, I i think that um this is what we're missing in a lot of these circles is that people mm. have to be willing to defend their themselves and their own people and their own culture and so yeah thank yeah, you my thank you very much yeah, it's a, that's big compliments. And then lastly, I just want to thank everyone that tuned in for all your questions or your comments, both profound and funny and just general <laughs> shit posts. Um, yeah, the, you guys always add to the content. And the, I, it, these streams wouldn't be half as fun if there wasn't also an audience that's taking yeah. part and that's adding to the content. It's really, like I always say, sometimes I just want to check out the chat. I don't want to pay attention <laughs> to the stream anymore because it gets so good. Yeah. Some of the, the, the jokes and the comments there get really, really <laughs> really excellent but anyway yeah sometimes i just want to be a commenter in the in the chat and talk shit with everyone um so <laughs> cheers guys uh have God a good bless. one good. and uh enjoy the rest of your weekend stay safe and uh i'll check you on the next one cheers guys have a good one and god bless